Welcome to this QuestMed SBA tutorial. My name is Yezin, and today we will be running through renal medicine and electrolytes. Today we will be discussing core principles of acute kidney injury, electrolyte disorders, and chronic kidney disease as representations of the core nephrology curriculum, as well as developing your understanding of clinical chemistry, the investigations you might do, as well as the management going forward. So let's start with the first question. Please pause the screen and have read to the question. So the answer here is E, urine output of 0.3 mil per kg per hour over the last 24 hours. So reading the question, we have a six-year-old man who comes in with shortness of breath and pleuritic chest pain. There seems to be evidence of a pneumonia, and we can see that he has bronchial breathing and there is consolidation in the left lower zone. And as you know, acute kidney injury is often associated with a number of critical illnesses, but also infections such as pneumonia. So this question is asking you to recall what the stages are for acute kidney injury. So rather than discussing each of the choices, we'll just go on to the actual classification itself and discuss it in more detail. So acute kidney injury can be stratified according to either the creatinine and also the urine output. So as you can see, there are three stages, stage one, two, and three, and that can be um, differentiated according to how much the creatinine is raised. So you have 1.5 times, two times, and three times um, in stage one, two, and three. And equally in the urine output, in stage one, you have usually less than 0.5 mil per kg per hour, equally with stage two, however, it's for 12 hours. As for stage three, it's 0.3 mil per kg per hour over 24 hours. And the reason this is important is because it's useful for us to know how bad someone's creatinine is, and therefore it will allow us to monitor more frequently, and maybe check the blood test more often. And also it will allow us to be on the lookout for any other complications of acute kidney injury, which we will discuss shortly. And equally, it maintains the point that in anyone with an acute kidney injury, particularly those who have a severe acute kidney injury, we will need to monitor their urine output very, very closely. So that would usually involve uh, putting in a catheter and checking someone's urine output regularly. Although sometimes that might be difficult in certain instances, for example, if you have an elderly patient who is incontinent, but obviously it's much easier in the intensive care setting. So that will be a decision that has to be made on each patient, whether or not we would insert a catheter in order to check if someone's uh, urine output is going lower than we would expect and we would treat accordingly. So in acute kidney injury, there are a number of risk factors that are very important to look out for. And the first one, which is probably the most important, is hypovolemia. So in patients who are hypovolemic, they're at a much higher risk of acute kidney injury due to the lack of perfusion of the kidneys in their illness. Um, equally, in patients who have a past medical history of chronic kidney disease, we would term that acute on chronic kidney disease, and equally certain comorbidities such as diabetes, heart failure, and renal transplant make you at higher risk, as well as being over the age of 75. And finally, this is important when we're considering someone to have, for example, a CT scan that would involve contrast administration we would be wary that this might cause further nephrotoxicity. So we may consider not giving contrast in certain situations or making sure that patients are very well hydrated before or after the scan. So that's something that may cause an acute kidney injury as well. So with acute kidney injury, the causes can be divided into pre-renal, renal, and post-renal. So here we have um, the pre-renal side. We can see that hypovolemia is an important cause of pre-renal kidney injury, as well as other aspects of renal vascular disease, such as renal artery stenosis. And that can happen in certain instances, for example, in patients who have uh, been started on an ACE inhibitor and they have underlying renal artery stenosis, and that can cause something that's called flash pulmonary edema. And that is a exam question that does come up from time to time. In terms of renal causes, it can affect different parts of the kidney, so the glomeruli, tubules, the interstitium, and the renal vessels, and that tends to be the domain of the nephrologist and where we would tend to do lots of nephrology screens looking for the cause of glomerular nephritis, for example, and you may want to investigate someone who has a proteinuria or a hematuria and worsening kidney function as they may be a renal cause. We'll talk about that in a bit more detail later. 
And in terms of post-renal causes, that can be a number of things um, and mainly related to blockage after the kidney. So that's why it's called post-renal. That could be a kidney stone, that could be a tumor, and that can also be some form of external compression, possibly via benign prostatic hypertrophy. And this image on the side indicates what you would see sometimes with a kidney stone and this classic loin to groin pain uh, that um, is quite severe and uh, quite uh, distressing to patients. And that may lead to worsening kidney function if the blockage is blocking the ureters. In terms of our investigations, we would do our normal blood tests as we normally would, particularly in people who are very unwell. We would do things like clotting, calcium. And also, if we're thinking about a glomerular nephritis, we would do our glomerular nephritis screen, which may include ESR, and CRP as well as we would do for infections. Uh, arterial blood gases are important. If someone has lots of edema, for example, they may be hypoxic. And as a complication of acute kidney injury, you may get acidosis and a hyperkalemia. So that's why an ABG is very important in the early stages when someone's critically unwell in order to guide their treatment going forward. It's useful to check the urine because you can get a, get a lot of useful information. With a urine dip, you can get a pyrotinuria, a hematuria, MCNS will help you look for infections. Urea and electrolytes will tell you how bad the kidney function is and stage appropriately. And equally, with osmolality, it may guide us in terms of if a patient is hyponatremic, for example, or hypernatremic. And uh, Ben's Jones protein may be useful for certain individuals who we think may have multiple myeloma, which can cause derangements of kidney function. With ECGs, we're looking for evidence of any hyperkalemic changes, which we'll talk about in more detail. Pulmonary edema may be found on the chest x-ray in patients who have a lot of fluid and are unable to pass the fluid as a result of many reasons. And finally, an ultrasound is very important to look for the renal size and look for any evidence of hydronephrosis. So hydronephrosis is a name for when kidneys are essentially when you have water on the kidney, which that's what it's called. And what happens is that you have blockage somewhere along the line from the kidney to the bladder, and that leads to this backlog of water and subsequent damage to the kidney. And you can see that on ultrasound. And that tends to be a cause of post-renal kidney and well, acute kidney injury. Um, so it's important to rule that out. So even if you have someone who you may think has an acute kidney injury secondary to a pre-renal cause, there may also be a post-renal element, for example. So you may want to investigate that as part of your screen going forward. In terms of the management of acute kidney injury, you have the pre-renal. A lot of it is related to the emergency setting, so Dr. A, B, C, D, E, as you have come across in the past, treating the cause, ensuring adequate hydration. In the renal causes, you would do your renal screens, and you may consider the nephrologist to come and see them. So, for example, if they have an autoimmune disease, you may consider them for steroids or immunosuppressants, for example, and that tends to be more specialist rather than something you would do uh, as an, an acute medic uh, in the medical take, for example. And finally, with post-renal, if you have someone who you are worried about uh, blockage, you may consider catheterizing, and then the urologists may be um, called to see them to arrange for any further investigations or whether or not any management needs to be done. If it's a kidney stone, for example, um, that needs to be removed. And with all these acute causes of acute kidney injury, we would monitor with regular observations, fluid status, and measurements of urine output as well, as uh, the patients can deteriorate further, and we need to make sure to deal with any complications as they come along. The other important aspect of acute kidney injury is medication review. So with um, acute kidney injury, you would want to stop ACE inhibitors or ARBs and diuretics and also uh, NSAIDs, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. You would suspend renally excreted drugs such as metformin, lithium and digoxin. And also there are certain drugs that may accumulate in acute kidney injury, such as opioids, particularly morphine. So if someone is on morphine with acute kidney injury and they're still in pain, you may want to consider them to consider to stop the morphine and start them on oxycodone instead. And that's because it doesn't accumulate as much in acute kidney injury and it is less likely to cause opioid toxicity. So just with regards to the concept of ACE inhibitors in acute kidney injury, I think it's important to remind ourselves what ACE inhibitors actually do. So they have a lot of roles in the renin angiotensin system, 
but actually uh, the key point here is that it inhibits afferent vasoconstriction. So basically what happens is that it leads to dilatation of the arteriole. And when renal perfusion is low, so for example, if you have low volume and you have a low perfusion to the kidney, what you need is actually angiotensin is quite useful in that sense because you need it to constrict the arteriole. And when you constrict the arteriole, you can maintain a good GFR. So the point here is that you should stop ACE inhibitors because you need your angiotensin to constrict the arteriole to maintain a good GFR to make sure that the renal perfusion is continues on to a greater extent. And this is in contrast to the use of ACE inhibitors in chronic kidney injury, which we'll talk about in a second. So let's look at this next question. If you'd like to pause the screen and have a read. So looking at this question, uh, we have a 40-year-old male with anchor-positive vasculitis presenting with oliguria and hematuria, and he has acute kidney injury, and there is rapidly progressive chrysenteric glomerulonephritis, which is quite a mouthful, but essentially represents a worsening acute kidney injury that's quite rapid, and it tends to be related to this anchor-positive vasculitis, which we won't go into in too much detail. So we're talking about the emergency management, the indications for dialysis. So you may know that potassium is related to um, acute kidney injury, so your potassium can go quite high. And we can see that here we have a potassium of 5.9. In most instances, in different trusts, uh, you would usually treat with a potassium of 6 to 6.5. So in this case, it's not sort of that bad in any case um, in order to treat that. And in most cases as well, we would only really treat for dialysis if there's a refractory high potassium. So we try to treat it a few times and it's still high. And that is an indication of dialysis. Looking at C, uh, we have an arterial blood gas that reveals a pH of 7.30. So you'll know that pH is normally between 7.35 and 7.45. And again here, although acidosis in itself is an indication for dialysis, I would say that this particular reading of acidosis is not low enough to consider dialysis. So perhaps we may consider more likely to consider dialysis if someone has a persistent pH of 7.2, for example, which is obviously very low. But in this particular scenario, I would just make a point that when you're thinking about reference ranges, try and understand what is normal, what is abnormal, what is severely abnormal, because that will have an indication on where we go in terms of management. In terms of D, the urine dipstick shows 3 plus of blood. That is possible in patients who have anchor-positive vasculitis, so having this hematuria, but again, would not be an indication for dialysis. And finally, patients who are hypertensive, although um, that, that is a very common complication of uh, both CKD and alcohol, can also happen in acute kidney injury. Blood pressure of 140 over 90 is not particularly raised, and if it was particularly raised as well, it not, wouldn't necessarily be an indication for dialysis. And finally, looking at B, the patient has severe chest pain, which is relieved by sitting forward. And this is an illustrative question to just make the point that this could be um, uremic pericarditis. So a pericarditis where you have is, is normally uh, found to be with patients who have chest pain that is relieved by sitting forward. And uremia in itself is an indication for dialysis. So if we look at the indications for dialysis and acute kidney injury, as we said, we can have acidosis. So usually that we would we would want that to be severe before we go ahead from dialysis. So it could be less than 7.2, but again, it will depend on each patient, but certainly not about 7.3, which is what we saw earlier. Electrolyte imbalance, particularly persistent hyperkalemia, is um, an important indicator of dialysis. Intoxication, so if someone has any evidence of any poisoning, i.e. have they taken or ingested any drug that has caused the acute kidney injury. And also this concept of refractory pulmonary edema. So when you have someone who has very bad pulmonary edema, we've tried to treat them on the wards, but it hasn't worked, then we might consider dialysis if that is related to their acute kidney injury. And finally, with uremia, that can cause many, many things, particularly an encephalopathy or pericarditis. That in itself would be an indication for dialysis. And just to illustrate the point, uh, this is uh, a, an example of extremely severe uremia, where it is severe enough to cause uremic frost that presents on this uh, patient's forehead, and it is, tends to be related to badly controlled chronic kidney disease, and um, it can 
it's very rare and um, I've not personally seen it, but it's something that is often uh, written about in textbooks. So just to give you an image to show you what that actually looks like. And with pericarditis, as we said, so on the ECG, for example, in here, you may see widespread ST elevation throughout lots of the leads. So that may give you a further indication that this is pericarditis and we would want to investigate further and consider a patient with AKI for pericardia for a dialysis as well. So let's have a look at the next question. If you'd like to pause the screen and have a read. So the answer here is diabetic ketoacidosis. So this is a question that you can figure out in a number of ways. So you could probably figure it out in one way by saying this is by looking at this and saying, oh, this is a 21 year old male with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and lots of other stuff and then looking at the glucose and it's 16 so that in itself you could consider this to be diabetic ketoacidosis but if you do it another way you could also think about another concept which is the anion gap so this is obviously a learning question some questions may not give you other information so they may decide to not give you the glucose so that may make it a bit more difficult and you're sort of stuck with uh, trying to work out the anion gap, which is the focus of this question, really. So we'll talk a bit about the anion gap. Um, so the anion gap is this theoretical concept that allows you to find out what certain causes of electrolyte abnormalities are. And we'll talk about that in more detail in a second. But the, re the um, equation that we use, as we can see here, is you add the sodium and the potassium and you subtract the chlorine and the bicarbonate and you get a reading. And in this case, it's 24.3. And usually we would expect it to be 10 to 18, around about that. So in this particular scenario, we have a raised anion gap. And if we look at the options that we have right in front of us, we have, let's look at lactic acidosis. So if you look at the lactate, it's 1.1, so that makes it less likely. And also uremia. So if we look at the urea, where's the urea? It's 8.1, which is not particularly raised um, in someone. We, if for uremia, you would expect it to be very, very, very raised, actually. So we're not less likely to be that. And with C and D, diarrhea and renal tubular acidosis type 1, those are both causes of a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. So that's another reason why diabetic ketoacidosis is the correct answer. So let's talk a bit more about the anion gap. So as we said, the anion gap is essentially a way for us to find out what the cause of someone's metabolic acidosis is. And I think about it in the way of how bicarbonate is affected. And basically what happens, for example, if we were to start off with a raised anion gap, you have an extra acid that is added. So for example, it's lactic acid as a cause of lactic acidosis. And the acid uses up bicarbonate. And therefore, what ends up happening is that the bicarbonate decreases. However, the unmeasured anion, so the, the anion of the lactic acid accumulates. So basically the gap increases. And this only really makes sense if we talk about normal anion gap, metabolic acidosis, in the sense that we have a reduction in bicarbonate, which is usually secondary to bicarbonate just being lost via different ways. And what happens is that it is matched by an increase in chloride to, so that the gap remains normal. And that leads to a normal anion gap. So really the way I think about it is that with a raised anion gap, you have an addition of an acid that uses up bicarbonate. And because we can't measure the anion, the anion gap increases. Whereas in the normal anion gap, you have a removal of bicarbonate in different ways that is matched by an increase in chloride. And therefore, the anion gap remains normal. And that is a useful way, theoretically, to distinguish between the two causes of metabolic acidosis. And if we go forward and talk about the different causes, that also gives us a bit more of an idea. So raised anion gap, this is a useful mnemonic that I use, so KUSMAL as a cause of raised anion gap metabolic acidosis. So we talked about diabetic ketoacidosis, uremia, salicylate poisoning, so if someone takes aspirin or NSAIDs, for example, and then obviously more obscure things like methanol and aldehydes, and, and, and that is less useful for you, but it's just part of the mnemonic that you use. Whichever mnemonic you want to use, there are many. Lactic acidosis, including metformin use, can also cause a raised anion gap 
uh, metabolic acidosis. And lactic acidosis can often come hand in hand with sepsis. As you know, that's part of the sepsis protocols that we use. We need to check the lactate. And that is tends to be the most common cause of a raised anion gap acidosis. I like mnemonics, so here's another one, just for reference's sake, um, so you can have a read if you want about the different other, other causes that are a bit more niche, if you so wish. As for the normal anion and, and gap metabolic acidosis, obviously there will be many, um, and as you know, with lots of things related to electrolytes, there will be uh, lots of lists, uh, but I've just pointed out the, in red the ones that tend to come up in your exams and also your day-to-day -day practice. So diarrhea is quite common because you're losing bicarbonate. And equally, if you're doing a surgical job, if you have someone with an ileostomy, someone is passing a large amount of fluid through the ileostomy. We call that high output ileostomy and you lose a lot of bicarbonate and that can cause this normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. And the other thing is with adrenal insufficiency. So if your adrenal ga uh, glands aren't working properly, what ends up happening is that normally you have the sodium coming in, as you know, and then the potassium comes out um, of the in the at the interface in the in the nephron. And also when the potassium comes out, you can also have hydrogen ions that come out as well. So if you have adrenal insufficiency and you don't have that much aldosterone, for example, your sodium is not going in and your potassium and your hydrogen ions are staying put. And because you have this accumulation of hydrogen ions, then you may get a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. So I guess it's just important for, for you to keep that in mind when anyone, when you have a question that asks you the cause of a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis as adrenal insufficiency can come up from time to time. As for metabolic alkalosis, that is usually related to a retention of a base or a loss of an acid. And again, you can see that there's a common scenario here that you get vomiting and diarrhea can cause electrolyte abnormalities. And in practice, that tends to be the case. So in this scenario, you're losing chlorides, you're vomiting, diarrhea as well. And also you can get diuretics that can cause it as well. The other stuff I would say is a bit more niche. I wouldn't worry about it too much, but just try to look at these features on a blood gas. So you have a increased pH, more than 7.45, and an increased HCO3, or the increased bicarbonate. And you may also get increased POC, PCO2 if partially or fully compensated. So I would just remind yourself that vomiting, diarrhea, those sort of things may cause a metabolic alkalosis, but certainly it's much less common than an acidosis. So let's look at the next question, if you'd like to pause the screen. So the answer here is heart failure. And you again, similar to the question on diabetic ketoacidosis, you can sort of work it out in different ways as well. So this question is a question about figuring out the causes of hyponatremia. So this question, you can figure it out by seeing that the patient has a raised JVP bi-basal crepitations, and mild peripheral edema to the mid-shins. You can probably work out it's heart failure in any case. But again, the heart of the question, they may not tell you this stuff, and they may just show you the electrolytes. So it's good to have an understanding in yourself about what causes hyponatremia in any case. So here we have a sodium of 1, 2, 3, and we have a normal potassium as well. And the kidney function is actually not too bad, as we can see. So looking at the answers here, we really need to differentiate between, in hyponatremia, the fluid status. So the causes of hyponatremia are divided according to fluid status if patients are hypervolemic, hypovolemic, or euvolemic. So in this scenario, let's look at the choices here. So with renal failure, you have hyponatremia, but also you would expect hypervolemia. So that sort of fits with what we have here. However, the kidney function is not deranged so that is less likely. SIADH, so syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion, you would expect the patients to be euvolemic, which is not the case here, and that's why it's incorrect. Dehydration, you would expect patients to be hypovolemic, which is not the case here, and also with hypothyroidism, you may expect them to be euvolemic as well. So heart failure is the only cause of this patient's 
possible hypervolemic hyponatremia given the kidney function is okay. So that's why it's the correct answer. And here in this x-ray, we can see evidence of loss of shadowing throughout the heart, which would be consistent with uh, pulmonary edema as well. So as we were talking about fluid status, uh, we have a number of causes of hypovolemic hyponatremia, and that can be related to things like diarrhea, vomiting, and also burns and sweating. And it can be related to people who are just very dehydrated as well, particularly in the elderly. As for euvolemic hyponatremia, the most common tends to be the syndrome of inappropriate ADH release. And classically, that tends to be related to two broad categories. So that can be related to brain tumors, for example, or brain surgery, or anything really that is related to the brain. So any brain pathology. So that's the first category. And the second category, classically, is that we find people who have lung pathologies who may have this as well. So patients who have lung cancer, patients who have an infection, like an ammonia in the lung, or patients who have sarcoidosis, for example. But really, in practice, the SIDH can be caused by a essentially anything. Um, not anything per se, but just any cause of a, a illness that can dis disrupt your body's electrolytes and can and cause electrolyte abnormalities. So therefore, you really should be thinking of SIDH in anyone who comes into hospital who's hyponatremic and they're euvolemic as well. So another thing that to, to look into is if they're on any medications, so certain things like anti-epileptics can cause it as well. So it's just something to always make sure to keep in the back of your mind in the sense that if someone is persistently hyponatremic, could this be SIADH? And finally, with hypervolemia, you can have it's related to be re renal failure, heart failure, liver failure as well. So mainly the failures, um, the, the three failures, as we would call them, and also nephrotic syndrome as well. So it's very important to make sure that you are able to categorize your causes of hyponatremia according to fluid status. As for investigations, we would want to do your normal urine, uh, urea and electrolytes, and that would help us to confirm the hyponatremia. The urine and plasma paired osmolalities and that will help us to indicate if there is inappropriate concentration of the urine. That helps us a lot in the SIDH, and equally with urine sodium, that also helps us to find out if there is sodium wasting in the kidneys. A urine dip helps us to screen for infection and glomerular disease with the high hematuria or proteinuria, and also TSH and cortisol. That will help us to exclude hypothyroidism and Addison's disease, which are less likely causes of um, euvolemic hyponatremia. In terms of management, it again depends on the type of hyponatremia that you have. If they're hypovolemic, you may treat them with IV saline and treat the underlying cause. If you have someone who has SIADH, you may consider fluid restriction. And the reason for that is because you are trying to maintain a lower amount of fluid and then allowing the sodium to come up slowly. And if that doesn't work after fluid restriction, you could consider ADH receptor antagonists, and you may also consider giving oral sodium frusamide. But again, you would really try to give it a good go with fluid restriction to start off with. With hypervolemic um, hyponatremia, again, fluid restriction is important and treating the underlying cause. I think the only other thing to mention about hyponatremia is that if someone has a very low sodium, we may consider calling the intensive care team because we really want to make sure not to increase the sodium too quickly as that can lead to fluid shifts in the brain and can lead to a disorder called central pontine myelinolysis. Because in certain instances, we, if someone has a very low sodium, we may want to give something called hypertonic saline, which is as you might expect, a higher concentration of saline, but we would want to give it in a very controlled environment so that we don't encounter this complication. So if you correct sodium faster than 12 millimole per day, then per liter per day, you will lead to an increased risk of the central pontine myelinolysis. So you can see here, this arrow is pointing to the pons, and you can see this white change, which indicates damage. And that is related to fluid shifts in the brain. And it can be quite a profound neurological disability 
uh, in someone who might have been previously well. So it's a very well feared disease. So you make sure that if someone has a very low potassium uh, sodium, you should consider discussing with the intensive care team. So let's look at this next question. If you'd like to pause the screen and have a read. So the answer here is dehydration. So the key points here is that we have an 88 year old lady, the number of past medical problems, and also she's tachycardic, hypotensive with dry mucous membranes and a reduced JVP. So we can see that the patient is hypernatremic, so 157, and also there is a raised urea and a raised creatinine as well. So looking at the other aspects of the choices, um, Essentially, we are trying to figure out the cause of this patient's hypernatremia. And the reason dehydration is correct is because when, you have, when you're dehydrated, the likelihood is that you are not taking enough fluid in, and that would make sense that you would have a high sodium. Whereas the other causes, Addisonian crisis, thiazide use, ramipril, and SIDH are all causes of a hyponatremia rather than a hypernatremia. And that's why this answer is correct. And we can define hypernatremia as a serum concentration of more than 145. And again, as you can see, we can have one of the common causes is diarrhea, vomiting, um, and, that the, and that tends to be a common pattern that we can see in electrolyte abnormalities. So if someone asks you what the cause of this electrolyte abnormality, diarrhea and vomiting is usually a good bet if you're not sure. But of course, you should read into it in a bit more detail when you are trying to look into why certain individuals have persistent hypernatremias or hyponatremias as things can get quite tricky afterwards. So the other um, aspects of hypernatremia, especially when you are on the acute medical take in that you have patients who have acute illness and they have decreased thirst and also patients who are of old age who may have dementia and they just don't drink and they forget to drink and a lot of it is about trying to encourage them to drink more fluid and if that's not the case, they can come into hospital quite often with hypernatremia and will require some oral fluids or IV fluids if it's quite severe. So that's another consideration um, in the practical sense when you're seeing patients on the wards. So let's look at this next question. If you'd like to pause the screen and have a read. So this is a question that some people struggle with. And the reason for that is because we really need to know what we're treating and why we're treating certain things. So we have a patient who has a potassium of 6.2 and we are looking at an EC. So the ECG, not this one, this is just an indicative ECG, um, shows rate controlled atrial fibrillation. Okay. So the idea really is here that, again, we talked about in certain trusts, they may treat if the potassium is 6 or 6.5. But in this particular scenario, we're assuming we're going to treat on out if the potassium is above 6. But the key when treating potassium is whether or not the ECG shows any evidence of any changes related to hyperkalemia. In this particular scenario, there are no changes related to hyperkalemia. It only shows a rate-controlled atrial fibrillation, which makes sense because he has a previous history of atrial fibrillation. So the question really becomes, do you actually treat with calcium gluconate first, or do you give them insulin and dextrose? Um, over 15 minutes in this scenario. And the answer is, if you do not have ECG changes, then you do not give calcium gluconate. Calcium gluconate is designed, uh, not designed, but it is meant to be given to protect the heart and to try and um, protect the heart if there is evidence of heart changes secondary to the potassium. So it wouldn't normally be given if there is no ECG changes. So therefore, that's why the correct answer is insulin and dextrose given over 15 minutes. And that would be aiming to reduce the serum potassium as insulin drives potassium into cells. Equally with oral flucemides, we may give that later on if we wanted to control it long term oral calcium rhizonium not really used. And again, hemodialysis wouldn't be the initial step in the management of the patient. We would consider uh, that later on, perhaps in this patient's journey. Um, 
And looking at this ECG, just to illustrate what ECG changes can look like, so you can see here that there is some tall tinted T waves. That tends to be the first sign that comes up in patients who have hyperkalemia and subsequent ECG changes. So causes of hyperkalemia, um, again, the red ones are the most common and should be uh, thought about early. So acute kidney injury uh, can lead to impaired potassium excretion and therefore is a common cause of hyperkalemia. Equally, medications such as ACE inhibitors, spironolactone can cause a hyperkalemia. So if someone has a hyperkalemia, you should try to suspend those for a few days and try to get on top of it. Equally, when you have someone who has rhabdomyolysis, that is when you have trauma to the muscle and that leads to breakdown of the muscle and subsequent hyperkalemia. And finally, digoxin toxicity. Digoxin toxicity can be a tricky one. So the digoxin itself sometimes can compete with the potassium to enter cells, and therefore it can be precipitated by hypokalemia if there's no potassium to compete with. However, if there is digoxin toxicity, it can cause a hyperkalemia. So that sometimes can be a bit difficult to get your head around. And with the um, ECG, you can see that this is called the reverse tick sign, which is consistent with digoxin toxicity. So just to commit that to memory when you are thinking about the causes of digoxin-related hyperkalemia and what you might see on the ECG. And the other cause of hyperkalemia, which is also common when you're on the wards, is a traumatic venipuncture, prolonged tourniquet use, delayed analysis of a taken sample. So essentially, the pseudo hyperkalemia, where it's not actually the real value, but it is related to issues associated with taking the blood sample. So I would always, if you're very worried about the patient or you need blood tests done, I would always take things to the lab myself rather than give it to someone because on a number of occasions, I will have given it to someone else and they forgot about it and it was delayed and they came back with a high potassium. So learn from my mistakes and make sure to take the sample to the lab yourself if you are at all concerned about an urgent sample that you need to investigate further. So um, if you have any concerns about the sample not being right, then you can just do it again. And with hyperkalemia and its management, we are really trying to protect the heart if there are ECG changes with calcium gluconate. We can lower serum potassium, with insulin and glucose. We can also give salbutamol later on. Sodium bicarbonate can be used to treat any acidosis that is associated with it. And we try to lower the body potassium. So we can restrict dietary potassium, avoid certain drugs like ACE inhibitors, spironolactone, and then later on, if things get really bad, then we can consider dialysis as a last resort um, in certain individuals or early on if someone has a very severe uh, acute kidney injury and it's leading to lots of disturbances in other parts of the body. And in terms of hyperkalemia, what we would actually use um, in terms of um, uh, severity, the initial things that we might see would be tall and tented T waves. The other aspects I wouldn't worry about too much, but just to note that one of the reasons we worry about the hyperkalemia is that it can lead to a ventricular fibrillation, a systole, and can lead to a cardiac arrest if it's very, very severe. So just to hone in on the urgency of the situation, that if you have someone with hyperkalemia, you should investigate urgently because of the risk of this ventricular fibrillation, a systole, and subsequent cardiac arrest um, or related cardiac arrest. So make sure to, if someone has a high potassium, do an ECG, treat early, and then that will hopefully guide your investigations going forward. So let's look at this next question. Uh, so we have a 74 year old man who is admitted feeling generally unwell. So if you'd like to pause the screen and have a read. So the answer here is severe diarrhea. So we have a patient who has a, who is hyponatremic and also hypokalemic. So we have, we're thinking about what the causes of this um, hyponatremia and hypokalemia would be in this scenario in the context of hypovolemia and possibly severe diarrhea would come across as the most likely in the first instance but equally 
there are other aspects that we need to consider. So we have someone who has chronic kidney disease. So chronic kidney disease, he may have chronic kidney disease um, anyways because of his high re and creatinine, but it's not the most likely cause of this presentation. So that is not the, mo the single best answer here. Ramipril is less likely because it's likely to cause a hyperkalemia rather than a hypokalemia. And with Kohn syndrome in itself, you may expect a high, high or normal sodium rather than a low sodium. And also you could consider a hypokalemia in that scenario. And also Addison's disease is not correct because you would expect a normal to raised potassium rather than a low potassium. So that really leaves us with severe diarrhea as a cause of this patient's electrolyte abnormalities. So the causes of hypokalemia would be related to inadequate oral intake, for example. Again, vomiting and diarrhea, increased gut loss tends to be a common cause. And um, also the one last thing in terms of in, in the red um, is on the bottom left is diuretics. So frusamide, thiazide diuretics can all cause a hypokalemia. So if someone has a hypokalemia, you may want to consider stopping these medications for a short period of time so that it can they can the electrolytes can be resolved. So make sure to always take a good medication history for anyone who has any electrolyte abnormalities as you may need to suspend certain medications. The management of hypokalemia will depend on how severe it is. If it's mild, you could just get away with giving someone oral sodium um, or potassium chloride and uh, treating the causes. If it's severe, it can lead to also some ECG changes as well. That may want you want to give someone sodium chloride with 40 millimoles of potassium, for example, and also you would be, be useful for you to check the magnesium as it has a relationship to potassium wasting as well. So make sure if someone has a very severe hypokalemia, you also make sure that they are appropriately monitored. You may want to put them on a cardiac monitor as well and make sure to treat the causes going forward. So in the last bit of this tutorial, we're going to talk about chronic kidney disease which is a very common disorder that can coincide with lots of different uh, medical problems and it tends to lead to a gradual and irreversible decline in kidney function. So a lot of the treatment measures that we use aim to try and reduce this decline and slow the decline going forward in order to minimize complications of which there are many. So we'll start off with the first question, if you'd like to pause the screen and have a read. So similar to the acute kidney injury question, this is related to your knowledge of the classifications of chronic kidney disease. And a lot of it is related to just unfortunately memorizing the table that is related to CKD. So but rather than looking through the choices again, we'll just go through the actual classification. So the stages of CKD uh, can be divided into five stages. So you have stage one and two, as you can see, and it all really depends on the estimated glomerular filtration rate, which is essentially a equation that is used that puts together things like creatinine, age, and sex, and allows us to estimate someone's uh, EGFR based on as a based on lots of research that was done. Um, a number of years back and sometimes it can be inaccurate and that's why and, and inaccurate in the sense that it doesn't really tell you that much about someone's kidney function and that's why in people who have a high um, or a rather a low EGFR around the 90s or 60 to 89 we would really only consider them to have CKD if there's evidence of kidney damage and in most cases that would indicate something like hematuria or proteinuria for example and once we get down to the uh, higher stages so three four and five it really depends on the EGFR in itself and that makes it less likely to be related to just um that makes it less likely to be related to um, inaccurate readings and it makes it definitely um, not really required to have any evidence of kidney damage. And once we get to the stage five, your EGFR is less than 15, that's when we would consider things like renal replacement therapy, which could be dialysis, hemodialysis, 
or peritoneal dialysis or renal transplant, for example. And finally, when we're talking about EGFR, they can be falsely low for a number of reasons. And in practice, the common causes might be patients who are black, and, the, and it is thought that patients who are black have a higher creatinine, perhaps because they have a higher muscle mass. That's one possible cause that's in the literature. And the other uh, cause of a falsely uh, low EGFR is trimethoprim, because that has a effect on creatinine reabsorption. So therefore, a trimeth- someone on trimethoprim may have a falsely high creatinine and therefore a low EGFR. But once you stop the trimethoprim, it should go back to normal on the most part. So that's just something to take into consideration when you're considering EGFR in itself. The causes of CKD, um, as you might know, diabetes, hypertension, and are tend to be the most common causes and and they are quite, in in themselves, diabetes and hypertension are very common causes um, of lots of disorders in the community. And equally, chronic glomerulonephritis and polycystic kidney disease are very common causes of CKD. And here is an image of polycystic kidney disease. And usually in adults, we have autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, which tends to come about when we see these cysts in the kidneys. Cysts can be all over the body, particularly in the liver. And it can also, uh, the other complications might be mitral valve prolapse. And also they may ha- you may have aneurysms in the brain, berry aneurysms, which can lead to a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So that's one of the side points of polycystic kidney disease that you may be expected to know for your exams. And other causes, again, this is more smaller print, vasculitis, amyloidosis, myeloma, is, uh, is does tend to come up because myeloma has a relationship with lots of other specialties and it's quite a rich disorder in itself, which we have talked about in our hematology lecture. And finally, vesico-uretic reflux that can be a cause of CKD, particularly if you have it for as a child, for example, and you have worsening kidney function of constant damage to the kidney due to reflux. And you will come across that more likely in your pediatric sections. So let's look at the next question, if you'd like to pause the screen and have a read. So uh, this is a hopefully more simple question in the sense that you just really need to know this very key fact. So I've I've dedicated an entire um, question to this because I want you to know that in patients who have chronic kidney disease, the chief cause of death in this condition is cardiovascular disease. So again, you can have all the other complications, so pulmonary edema, metabolic acidosis, hypocalcemia, and anemia, but really the most common cause of death is cardiovascular disease. So anyone who has CKD, or is on dialysis and they have chest pain, you really, really need to take it seriously. Consider treating them for or investigating further for a myocardial infarction, as it may certainly um, increase the risk of that. So, this is another useful mnemonic. So, CRF heals for complications of CKD, cardiovascular disease, we talked about. Renal osteodystrophy tends to be related to the fact that kidneys. Uh, are important in activating vitamin D. And therefore, if you don't have that ability to do so, you will have a low calcium. And that sort of low calcium will lead to lots of bone changes. It can look a bit like this osteomalacia, um, and it will uh, it can lead to a lot of bone pain and can lead to structural abnormalities as well. Fluid in the way of pulmonary edema, so this fluid retention, because that's what the kidneys do, it excretes fluid. If you can't do that, then it will lead to this edema. So one of the treatments is fluid restriction for that. Hypertension, as we have, as we might expect in someone who is unable to, it may be related to fluid shifts as well, but in any case, hypertension also, as you know, can be a cause of chronic kidney disease. So they tend to correlate in different ways. Electrolyte disturbances, we've talked about earlier, and anemia is related to the fact that kidneys secrete erythropoietin, and if they're not working properly, you may have an anemia. And finally of note, this sensory neuropathy tends to be related to your, uh, this uremia, so urea deposition in the nerves can lead to this sensory neuropathy, um, and patients can have tingling in their arms or their legs, for example.
and managing chronic kidney disease, the complications for edema, fluid restriction, salt restriction. You could consider giving frusamide. In anemia, we would consider erythropoietin. And for hypocalcemia, um, we also can get hyperphosphatemia because the kidneys can't excrete it. So we would really try to restrict certain um, aspects of the diet, to restrict potassium, to restrict phosphate. And we may also give someone a phosphate binder such as Sevelamir. And we may also treat someone with alpha-calcidolol, which is a vitamin D analog, and that will try and increase the amount of calcium that's in the body and reduce the risk of this renal bone disease, uh, the osteodystrophy that we talked about earlier. So let's look at this next question. If you'd like to pause the screen and have a read. And the answer here is Rampro. So we have someone who has type 1 diabetes and they have a raised urinary albumin creatinine ratio. So the, this is important and you may have come across this in the past. So anyone who has chronic kidney disease and they have increased proteinuria, and that was indicative here by the raised albumin creatinine ratio, one of the most important drugs that we can give um, is ramipril or ACE inhibitors in order to slow the progression of this condition. And really, it's about this disorder called microalbinuria. And you really need to make sure that patients have regular urinary albumin creatinine ratio in order to make sure that um, their disease is slowed, as progression can lead to further nephropathy and chronic kidney disease and will increase their likelihood of needing renal replacement therapy. So you would treat with an ACE inhibitor. And really what the way it works is that you have this, so you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to reduce the proteinuria. And this is associated in lots of large trials with renal protection. And as we talked about earlier, what ACE inhibitors do is that they inhibit afferent vasoconstriction and they lead to dilatation of the arteriole. And when you have dilatation of the arteriole, there is a fall in filtration pressure and because there's less of a gradient that goes across. And with this fall infiltration pressure, that contributes to the anti-proteinuric effect and at least to long-term renal protection. So in contrast to what we were talking about earlier, kidneys in CKD, ACE inhibitors are quite protective, whereas in AKI, acute kidney injury, they can be nephrotoxic for the reasons we discussed earlier. So that's an important distinction to know when to use ACE inhibitors in kidney disease in general. And finally, we'll just talk a bit more about renal replacement therapy. Um, it is important to consider this in patients who have a very low EGFR, usually less than 15. And we may want to prepare patients earlier on um, in order to tee them up for these quite invasive treatments that you might give. So the first that we'll talk about is hemodialysis. And basically, hemodialysis works by diffusion of solutes. So what patients will normally have is they would have a fistula, usually in their arm, and that would uh, take blood into the dialyzer, and it would try, and the solutes would diffuse out and be taken back into the patient. Um, and hemodialysis importantly works by diffusion as opposed to hemofiltration, which can be used more likely in the intensive care unit, and that tends to work by convection and tends to be related to larger solutes. So hemodialysis is quite good in getting a lot of the smaller solutes be pushed out, and it can be used as a quite a long-term um, treatment for patients who have end-stage chronic kidney disease. There are, of course, many complications, and um, the first among them, as we said, cardiovascular disease is very much related to that. You can have complications with your fistula, and that can be related to stenosis, aneurysms, and infection, similar to what you would do normally if you, seems what you would have if you were to have any, um, any surgery, essentially, to the arm. Um, so this, um, especially in terms of the vascular supply, steel syndrome can be related to ischemia due to lack of blood supply and also heart failure as well. Hypotension can be related to fluid shifts in hemodialysis, and that can be quite difficult for patients to deal with. Amyloidosis 
can be uh, a result of buildup of B2 microglobulin, and that can be secondary to hemodialysis, although that's a bit more small print. And finally, this concept of a dialysis disequilibrium syndrome, where you can get acute cerebral edemia due to rapid extraction of these substances that are in the body. And basically, I think with hemodialysis, it's just important for you to realize that with lots of fluids being shifted across can lead to a number of complications, um, of which hypotension here, dialysis disequilibrium syndrome can occur as well. Peritoneal dialysis is another way to renally uh, replace or replace people's kidney function and uh, what happens is that you have a tube that enters the peritoneum and uh, you have the uh, dialysate which enters the peritoneum and fluid diffuses across and uh, the main issue with peritoneal dialysis um, apart from the fact that it's quite invasive is that you may have infection of the peritoneum termed peritonitis. So if anyone on peritoneal dialysis comes in with pain, sweating, fever, and just look unwell, you need to rule out peritonitis. So that's something to look into further and keep alert about this complication. And finally, renal transplant is often a life-saving treatment for patients who are um, having um, a end-stage kidney failure. And the, the renal transplants are, they tend to be transplanted in the anterior, uh, so it can be in the right or left iliac fossa, whereas, as you know, the kidneys themselves are retroperitoneal structures, and that's why you can palpate kidneys in the, um, in the abdomen uh, on examination, and we look for that uh, as part of our exa uh, abdominal examination normally. And with kidney transplants, the complications are very, very important to look out for. So you can get things like infection, graft issues, and thrombosis, which you may expect in lots of surgical cases in any case. But otherwise, you should really always look out for side effects of drugs. So with kidney transplants, you may have immunosuppressants, such as steroids, for example. You may also have patients who have... Um, things like tacrolimus or cyclosporin, which can increase your risk of infections going forward, can lead to things like gum hypertrophy, can lead to rashes. So really, when you're examining patients who you think may have had a renal transplant, you always need to make have a good look at the skin and also have a good look at their, um, their mouth as well to look for any gum hypertrophy or any changes there. So that's a, an, an aspect of renal transplants and how it can affect the rest of the body. And finally, you can have different types of rejection um, in kidney transplants. So um, a lot of it is related to the time frame. So hyperacute rejection tends to be related to blood group incompatibility. And that can happen very early on after the transplant. Um, and also you can have an acute rejection within six months. That's the normal time frame. It doesn't sound so acute, I suppose, but when you think that the hyperacute is very early on, the first sort of minutes, hours, days, um, you the acute rejection within six months tends to be related to this cell-mediated autoimmunity. And finally, you can have chronic rejection, which occurs after six months, and that tends to have a bit more of an unclear cause, and it can be related to worsening a kidney function with with an unknown cause but i think for your purposes i wouldn't worry about it too much i just know the time frames in terms of six months after six months for acute and chronic and that a hyper acute rejection is related to abo incompatibility so thank you for joining us for this questmed sba tutorial hope you found it useful all the uh, notes for this uh, topic today are in our quest book so if you look at bit.ly slash the quest book Follow us on Instagram for daily single best answer questions at QuestMed. And then please do subscribe to our channel.